Good morning. It is Wednesday, June the 26th, and this is The Drill. And thank you very much. My name is Ronald T. Hardgrove, and uh, this is my podcast called The Drill. It's about being a true conservative and uh, the difference between being a true conservative, being a reactionary, a traditionalist, or a socialist. It's about what defines these uh, philosophical theories and why it matters. My podcast is made possible by Spreaker.com, and it can be heard on iTunes and Spotify, among others. Uh, My email address is uh, storytimes at hotmail.com. I'm on Twitter at Ronald Hardgrove and on Facebook at The Drill. I started my sociopolitical odyssey as a conservative Republican. I assumed that I was a conservative because of where I stood on the issues. However, whenever I engaged a liberal in debate, even though I knew I was right, I felt as though I was losing the argument. I also noticed that the right-wing pundits that I listened to on the radio struggled as well. If I know that I'm right, but I'm losing the argument, then something is wrong. It was then that I decided to investigate the liberal conservative dynamic. I started by reading a book by Ayn Rand titled Philosophy, Who Needs It? I learned from the book that philosophy is not optional, that it is an inescapable, inherent part of life. I learned also about essences and accidents. And uh, these facts opened my eyes, and I looked at the world in a new way. I saw that there was depth to the world, that the way that uh, right-wing pundits were presenting the world was as being very shallow, that everything was basically politics, and there was, there was nothing else, and that everything in, in life was informed by our politics. And as a matter of fact, it's the opposite way around. Uh, I concluded that the right can't win on the issues because the issues are trapped for the unwary. The issues were created by the left for the left. I also discovered that uh, being truly conservative is all about knowing that the essence of any argument is change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, is realistic and conservative. And if it ain't broke, break it is idealistic and socialist. The issues are not the basis of my thinking, but the result. And uh, what is the status quo? First, individuality. True conservatives know that the individual is primary. The rights enumerated in the Constitution are individual rights. Uh, They are not human rights. The true conservative thinks as an individual for and about individuals. By conceding the concept we, reactionary Republicans, allow themselves to be trapped into groupthink, inadvertently promoting the very thing they claim to despise, a bloated, overreaching bureaucracy. The second thing that we can serve is government neutrality. It's very, very important. This country cannot survive if the government is taking sides. Because we cannot have confidence in our government if our government is choosing sides. Uh, Look at where we're at with the courts. We have the Ninth Circuit, which is uh, generally uh, the general consensus seems to be that it's a left-wing circuit. It's a political circuit, not a legal circuit, not a judicial circuit, filled with people that are neutral on things, on the issues, and are therefore trustworthy to make decisions about disputes between individuals, they are biased. They are biased in favor of particular administrations. They are biased in favor of particular groups of people. And then, therefore, biased against the individual. Uh, Republicans that define themselves by the issues encourage the very government bias that Crowleyists in the U.S. have been promoting since the early party of the 20th century. Uh, A word about the left. In reality, they have no authority, they have no power, and they can't win. The only reason that they appear to win is that Republicans give them their victories. Republicans, especially talk show hosts, aid and abet the left. 
The biggest mistake that so-called conservative talk show hosts make is failing to make distinctions, judgmental distinctions. Um, they have to, conservatives need to remind the public of the superiority of their beliefs every opportunity that they get. Being a Republican, being a conservative, being a capitalist is better than, and is the best and or better than the alternative, which is being a, a liberal, a socialist, uh, etc. Oh, yeah, capitalist and socialist. So it would be a Democrat, liberal, or socialist. But anyhow, uh, they've got to refuse to pretend that they're neutral. Uh, and let me be clear. Being truly conservative is realistic, effective, and true. Anything else is idealistic, ineffective, and false. Or to put it more simply, being truly conservative is right, and everything else is wrong. The second biggest mistake uh, that uh, so-called conservative talk shows make is confusing reactionary with conservative. Being a reactionary is an anti-conceptual mentality that involves reacting to arbitrary claims and aping the left. Arbitrary claims are those claims that lack evidence or proof. Aping the left means copying their communication style, which means making predictions and using anti-concepts. Making predictions deprives conservatives of value by substituting forecasting for moralizing. Moralizing involves judgment. Judgment is used to decide ultimately what is real and what is imaginary. We use judgment instead of prediction because we need to answer the question, what should I do, not what is going to happen. Using anti-concepts aids the left in obliterating legitimate concepts such as property and conflict of interest. The third biggest mistake pundits make is in confusing traditionalism with conservatism. Traditionalism demands a slavish devotion to the status quo, and it's a mistake because it is as idealistic as socialism. The socialist tells himself, if only we could get rid of the status quo, we'd be all set. And the traditionalist tells himself, if only we could get rid of change, we'd be all set. While the conservative asks himself, should we change? If it is true that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then the right-wing pundits do more to honor the left than to defeat it. And um, so, yeah, when I come back, I'm going to be reading from the, I'm going to read the concept of the day from the Ayn Rand lexicon, which is uh, the concept of the day is government. Thank you very much. Welcome back. The uh, Ayn Rand lexicon and the concept of the day. And the concept of the day is government. Uh, government is an institution that holds the exclusive power to enforce certain roles of social conduct in a given geographical area. If physical force is to be barred from social relationships, men need an institution charged with the task of protecting their rights under an objective code of rules. This is the task of a government, of a proper government. It's basic task, it's only moral justification, and the reason why men do need a government. A government is the means of placing the retaliatory use of physical force under objective control, i.e. under objectively defined laws. The only proper purpose of a government is to protect man's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence. Proper government is only a policeman acting as an agent of man's self-defense, and as such, may resort to force only against those who start the use of force. The proper uh, functions uh, of a government are the police to protect you from criminals, the army to protect you from foreign invaders, and the courts to protect your property and contracts from breach or fraud by others, to settle disputes by rational rules according to objective law. But a government that initiates the employment of force against men who has Force no one. The employment of armed compulsion against disarmed victims is a nightmare, infernal machine designed to annihilate morality. If such a government rever reverses its only moral purpose and switches from the role of protector to the role of man's deadliest enemy, from the side of policeman to the role of a criminal vested with the right to the wielding of violence against victims deprived 
of the right of self-defense, such a government substitutes for morality the following rule of social conduct. You may do whatever you please to your neighbor, provided your gang is bigger than his. In other words, might makes right and the ends justify the means. The source of the government's authority is the consent of the governed. This means that the government is not the ruler, but the servant or agent of its citizens. It means that the government as such has no rights except the rights delegated to it by the citizens for a specific purpose. The the difference between political power and any other kind of social power between a government and any private organization is the fact that a government holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force. This distinction is so important, so seldom recognized today, that I must urge you to keep it in mind. Let me repeat it. A government holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force. So, let's see here. Um, Where are we at here? There it is. No individual, private group, or private organization has the legal power to initiate the use of physical force against other individuals or groups or compel them to act against their own voluntary choice. Only a government holds that power. The nature of governmental action is coercive action. The nature of political power is the power to force obedience under threat of physical injury, the threat of property, expropriation, imprisonment, or death. The fundamental difference between private action and governmental action, a difference thoroughly ignored and evaded today, lies in the fact that a government holds a monopoly on the legal use of physical force. It has to hold such a monopoly since it is the agent of restraining and combating the use of force. And uh, for that very same reason, its actions have to be rigidly defined, delimited, and circumscribed. No touch of whim or caprice should be permitted in its performance. It should be an impersonal robot with the laws as its only motive power. If a society is to be free, the government has to be controlled. Under a proper social system, a private individual is legally free to take any action he pleases so long as he does not violate the rights of others. While a government official is bound by law and is every official act, a private individual may be doing anything except that which is legally forbidden. A government official may not do anything except that which is legally permitted. This is the means of subordinating might to right. This is the American concept of a government of laws and not of men. And so basically what she's talking about here, especially this, um, let me see here. Uh, Here we go. There it is. It should be an impersonal robot with the laws as as its only motive power, which is what I was talking about earlier. What is it that conservatives are conserving? And one of them is uh, the uh, neutrality of the government. In order for the the government to be an impersonal robot, it has to be neutral. That means we cannot have issues-based politics. Issues-based politics uh, demands and promotes... Uh, bias. When we go out and we say to, uh, to a president, uh, to a candidate that's for office, a governor, or whatever, or especially in the judiciary, and we say to them, uh, these are the issues, and then ask them, where do you stand on the issues? We're asking them, we're demanding of them that they declare their bias, and more importantly, we are expecting them to act on that bias. Look at the Supreme Court. The battle for the Supreme Court is always seems to be not about um, the questions aren't about whether somebody is neutral, but merely which side of the fence they stand on. That has to change. Uh, Republicans and conservatives need to emphasize neutrality. We need to demand from our officials neutrality. We need to talk to them about and ask them about neutrality. Yes, we expect that you have personal viewpoints and biases. Are you willing and able to put them aside in order to promote government neutrality? To let the world know that the government of the United States of America does not prejudge anything. Because Only with a a neutral government can we have confidence. Can every American have confidence in our government and have confidence that if uh, we go to court 
with a particular issue, no matter what it happens to be, that we will get a fair hearing and that the court will decide the issue on the merits and on the law and not on the issues. So that was the um, government is the uh, concept of the day for from the uh, Ayn Rand lexicon. Back in a minute. Thank you very much. Welcome back. And now from the conservative uh, dictionary, two entries. First entry is columnist, noun, a communist or socialist who writes a column for a newspaper, e.g. Paul Krugman of the New York Times et al. Uh, So I'm getting the impression that the author here is uh, putting in some entries and and giving definitions that are uh, tongue-in-cheek. Second one is common sense, noun, a mental state achieved through reality-based, results-focused thinking unencumbered by personal or political considerations. Two, to a liberal, a major source of cognitive dissonance. Three, to a conservative, the quickest way to make a liberal mad. And used as an adjective, it means conforming to reality, not distorted by myths or ideologies, as in thought, speech, or actions. That was two entries from the conservative uh, dictionary. Back in a minute. Thank you very much. Welcome back. And so I wanted to uh, make uh, some commentary on a couple of issues. Um, First of all, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was uh, metaphysics. And the uh, metaphysics is, there's two types of reality, metaphysical reality and man-made realities. And so metaphysical realities are such, there's three basic uh, rules of, or laws of metaphysical reality. Number one, you cannot be in two places at the same time. Number two, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And number three, uh, all actions, all decisions have consequences, good and bad. And the reason this is important is because a lot of politicians are going to try to convince us that uh, they are going to be, that they can violate those metaphysical laws. Uh, Convince us that uh, people can be in two places at the same time, that they can have their cake and eat it too, and that they need not suffer consequences for anything. Um, And a classic case of that is the um, Affordable Health Care Act uh, that was enacted during uh, President Obama's administration uh, in which uh, it was campaigned for on the basis that uh, people were going to be, uh, the whole idea, the whole attractive uh, feature of this was that people were no longer going to have to make tough decisions. Baloney. Uh, Making tough decisions is just simply part of life. And uh, no politician can take that away from you. The only thing the politician can do uh, through the passing of laws is change the type of uh, tough decisions that you have to make. So it's not going to prevent you from having to decide, uh, make tough decisions versus health care versus something else. Um, In the um, Obama administration, President Obama was talking about how people were having to choose between uh, paying for health care or paying the rent for instance. Uh, Well, sometimes that happens. You have that kind of a a choice. If it wasn't health care, it might be something else. You might have to make uh, some other kind of a very tough choice. And if uh, the, and it did, the uh, Obamacare, so-called Obamacare bill passes, it's not taking away any of your uh, decisions. You, You know, it's not taking away any tough decisions. It's changing them in certain ways, but it is not Uh, eliminating them. It's not putting you in a position where you can operate with impunity. There's still consequences for your actions. No politician can get rid of that. So that's uh, one thing that you need to uh, remember. You hear a politician trying to tell you that they can uh, suspend metaphysical reality. Um, uh Uh-uh. Second thing is that uh, it it was reported in the Washington Times that uh, Eric Trump went ahead, uh, he was in Chicago apparently, and 
he was, uh, I don't know, know exactly what he, why he was there, uh, but he, he was there and apparently some woman spit on him. Uh, apparently she is a Democrat. And I want to go ahead and take the time to say, and I'm reporting, I want to emphasize this, because you're, you may very well hear other um, talk show hosts, podcasters, talk about this as well, and they're going to get it wrong. They're going to get it wrong. But uh, the right way, the right response is to say, see, Republicans and conservatives would never do such a thing. We would never do that. We are better than that. We are better than the socialists. We are better than the liberals. We are better than the Democrats. That's the right answer. That's the right response. But what you're going to hear is Rush Limbaugh say something to the effect that, um, see, imagine if a Republican did that. Imagine if a conservative did that. Then the, the news media would be all over it. There would be boycotts. There would be blah, blah, blah. And what he's doing is uh, two things. Number one, he's morally uh, equivalent, creating a moral equivalence between the two parties, saying the Democrats and Republicans are really exactly alike. And second thing he's doing is it makes it sound as though he's jealous. How come they get to spit on people and we don't? They don't get to. We don't want to. We don't do it because we're better than they are. This is the mistake, one of the biggest mistakes that Republicans make, is they fail to make uh, judgmental distinctions between conservatism and republicanism and their political opponents. We are better. Okay, you, you, Republicans wonder why there's so many people that will call uh, Rush Limbaugh and, at all and say, there's no difference between the parties. I've heard it myself. I listen to Rush Limbaugh and I hear callers say, you know, Rush, there's really not much difference between the two parties. And Rush says, no, no, that's not true. Because he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't understand where that's coming from. He doesn't understand that he contributes to that mentality. Every time he morally he creates a moral equivalency between the two parties by saying, what if we did that? Then he is encouraging people to decide that there's no difference between the parties. Now, what about young people? What about somebody who's 18 years old considering whether or not they want to be a Democrat or a Republican? And, and Republicans are always looking for new people. So are the Democrats. But Republicans very often are saying, how come we're not getting, we're not getting the youth vote? Why aren't we getting minority votes, non-white votes, non-male votes, women's votes? Why aren't we getting people like that? This is one of the reasons. Why? Why would I want to become a Republican? Why would I want to become a conservative if morally, ethically speaking, it is no different than being a liberal. I wouldn't. So uh, the Rush Limbaugh et al., they must start making the clear-cut difference between every day, all day. Every time a situation like this happens, they need to take advantage of it and say, see, the Democrats are the bad guys. The liberal socialists are the bad guys. We're the good guys. We're the ones, we are better than they are. We wouldn't dare spit on them. We have civility. So, back in a minute. Thank you very much. And now I want to read from uh, the reactionary mind. Uh, it's, a, it's a book about conservatism and basically it conflates being a reactionary, being a conservative, which is wrong. Uh, being a conservative is separate and distinct from being a reactionary. Usually being a reactionary is associated with being a traditionalist. And a traditionalist is different from a conservative in that uh, the traditionalist asks, uh, tells himself, gee, if only we could get rid of change, we'd be all set. The conservative says, should we change? 
The conservative has an open mind. The conservative is willing to change, but only if there is a compelling or convincing reason to change. Uh, so anyways, this is, uh, um, pick, I'm picking up where I left off with uh, the reactionary mind. There's a fairly simple reason for the embrace of radicalism on the right, and it has to do with the reactionary imperative that lies at the core of conservative doctrine, BS. The conservatives not only opposes the left, he also believes the left has been in the driver's seat since, depending on who's counting, the French Revolution or the Reformation. And it's true, they have been in the driver's seat and in large part because they're able to trick conservatives, trick Republicans into aiding and abetting their movement. So, back to the book. If he is to preserve what he values, the conservative must declare war against the culture as it is. No. Uh, Through the spirit of militant opposition, uh, though the spirit of militant opposition pervades the entirety of conservative discourse, Dinesh D'Souza has put the case most clearly. Typically, the conservative attempts to conserve, to hold on to the values of the existing society. But what if the existing society is inherently hostile to conservative beliefs? It is foolish for a conservative to attempt to uh, conserve that culture. Rather, he must seek to undermine it, to thwart it, to destroy it at the root level. This means that the conservative must be philosophically conservative, but temperamentally radical. Uh, so, again, he gets away with this because he, do, he fails to define his terms. When you, you define your terms as conservatives, the person that makes the presumption for the status quo, and that is the basis for conservatism, it turns his idea completely on its head. I'm not at war with anybody. I get up in the morning and I say, you know what? The world is a pretty damn good place for most of us, most of the time. When somebody comes along and says, we ought to do things differently, I don't react and say, no, 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 no. Don't you dare. That's reactionary and traditionalist. I say, really? Why? Because I'm a conservative and I have an open mind. And a but, I keep in my mind the idea that the people that want change have the burden of proof. Always, 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 always. Okay, and I insist that they convince me, logically, reasonably, rationally, convince me that there's a case for change, change is necessary, and that whatever change is uh, that they're proposing is the best remedy or course of action. Some of the obvious cases for change are slavery, Jim Crow, and uh, another a uh, couple of a uh, few more are uh, public employee unions. That's an obvious case for change, an on the face case for change. Uh, another one is the regulation of lawyers by lawyers. That's an obvious case for change. Uh, And the last one I can think of off the top of my head is the regulation of doctors by doctors. All of those, uh, the the employee unions, the doctors and the lawyers are all uh, involved in conflicts of interest. And conflict of interest is the essence, the very center and core of corruption. And what is corrupt is wrong. It must be rooted out, and it must be done away with. So, um, so again, if he d- defined his terms, he would have uh, figured out that this isn't about uh, conservative beliefs. That conservatism is deeper. It is, and it is right. It is demonstrably right because it is realistic. Back to the book. By now, it should be also clear that it is not the style or pace of change that the conservative opposes. The conservative theorist likes to draw a, quote, manifest marked distinction, unquote, between evolutionary reform and radical change. Shallow analysis. It actually goes, uh, conservatism goes much deeper than that. The first, slow, incremental, and adaptive. The second is fast, comprehensive, and by design. But that distinction so dear to Burke and his followers, is often less clear in practice than the theorist allows. 
Political theory is designed to be abstract, but what abstraction has implied, has impelled such diametrically opposed political programs as the preference for reform over radicalism, evolution over revolution. In the name of slow, organic, adaptive change, self-declared conservatives opposed the New Deal. Robert Nisbet, Kirk, and Whitaker Chambers and endorsed the New Deal uh, and endorsed the New Deal. Peter uh, Virick, Clinton, Rossiter, and Whitaker Chambers. A belief in edge evolutionary reform could lead one to adopt a Hayekian defense of the free market or the democratic socialism of Edward Bernstein. Quote, even Fabian socialists, unquote, Nash Tartley observes, quote, who believed in the inevitability of gradualness might be labeled conservatives, unquote. Conversely, as Abraham Lincoln pointed out, it's just as easy for the left to claim the mantle of preservation as it is for the right. Quote, you say you are conservatives, unquote, he declared to the slaveholders. And um, I will continue that in a second. But I did want to comment on uh, a belief in evolutionary versus revolutionary reform is, again, crap. He uses the New Deal as an example. My example for the New Deal is that people, there's people that are opposed and, were, and in favor of it. And a conservative would not necessarily be knee-jerk against it. Say, well, this has changed, therefore it must be left, therefore I must oppose it. The, the conservative is going to say, why? Why should we do this? Why do we need a New Deal? And even if we do need a New Deal, why does it have to be all of the things you're including in this new deal. Why do we have to change all of these various uh, things? He asks why and keeps asking why until he is convinced that the change is necessary and that the type of change being recommended is valid. Uh, Back to the book, and it's back to uh, Abraham Lincoln's quote. Quote, eminently conservative, while we are revolutionary, destructive, or something of the sort, What is conservatism? Is it not adherence to the old and tried against the new and untried? We stick to, contend for, the identical old policy on the point in controversy which was adopted by, quote, our fathers who framed the government under which we live, unquote, while you with one accord reject and scout and spit upon that old policy and insist upon substituting something new. Not one of all your various plans can show a precedent or an advocate in the century within within which our government originated. Consider then whether your claim of conservatism for yourself and your charge of destructiveness against us are based on the most clear and stable foundations. More often, however, the blurriness of the distinction has allowed the conservative to oppose reform, oppose reform on the grounds that either it will lead to revolution or that it is revolution. Indeed, with the exception of uh, Peel and Baldwin, no Tory leader has ever pursued a consistent program of uh, preservation through reform, and even Peel could not persuade his party to follow him. Burke himself was not immune to the argument that reform leads to revolution, even though he spent the better part of the decade uh, preceding the American Revolution, contesting that argument, he still wondered, quote, when you open, unquote, a constitution, quote, to inquiry in one part, unquote, which would seem to be the definition of slow reform, quote, where will the inquiry stop, unquote? Other conservatives have argued that any demand from or on behalf of the lower orders, no matter how tepid or tardy, is too much, too soon, too fast. Reform is revolution. Improvement is insurrection. Quote, it may be good or bad, unquote. A gloomy Lord uh, uh, Carnivaran wrote of the Second Reform Act of 1867, a bill 20 years in the making that tripled the size of the British electorate. Quote, but it is a revolution, unquote. Minus the opening qualification, this was a repeat of what Wellington had said about the First Reform Act. Across the Atlantic, Wellington's contemporary Nicholas Biddle was denouncing Andrew Jackson's veto of the Second Bank, that most um, constitutionally exercised of constitutional powers. In similar terms, quote, it has been all the fury of a chained panther biting at the 
bars of his cage. It really is a manifesto of anarchy, such as Marat or Robespierre might have issued to the mob, unquote. Today's conservative may have made his peace with some emancipation's past. Others, like labor unions and, uh, and reproductive freedom, he still contests. But that does not alter the fact that when those emancipations first arose as a question, whether in the context of revolution or reform, his predecessor was in all likelihood against them. Michael Gerson, former speechwriter for George W. Bush, is one of the few contemporary conservatives who acknowledged the history of conservative opposition to emancipation. Where other conservatives like to lay claim to the abolitionist or civil rights mantle, Gerson admits that, quote, honesty requires the recognition that many conservatives in other times have been hostile to religiously motivated reform, unquote, and that, quote, the conservative habit of mind once opposed most of these changes, unquote. Indeed, as Samuel Huntington suggested half a century ago, saying no such movements in real time may be what makes someone a conservative throughout time, unquote. So I'm thinking also is that perhaps when you're looking at um, uh, the, the distinction here then would be between being conservative and being Republican. Because it's certainly, uh, definitely, um, it was Republicans that were pushing the abolition of slavery, Democrats, by and large, were not. And it was uh, Republicans that were trying to get, after slavery was abolished, uh, reforms put into place uh, called the Civil Rights Act. There was a Civil Rights Act of 1875. There was a Civil Rights Act of 1957. Uh, Both of those signed by Republican presidents. Um, uh, Ulysses S. Grant in in the case of the 1800s and Dwight D. Eisenhower in the case of 1957. However, the only civil rights acts that we usually end up talking about are the ones that were signed by a Democrat president, Lyndon Johnson, in 1965. So uh, that's going to be concluding this little uh, part of the chapter in The Reactionary Mind. Back in a minute. And uh, thank you very much. And tomorrow I'm going to be reading from uh, uh, an excerpt from Out of the Ashes, uh, Reclaiming and Rebuilding American uh, Culture. So, But uh, who are the true conservatives? They are the people that understand that conservatism is not just political but cultural as well. They are poli- patriotic people who use common sense. They make judgments instead of predictions, speak clearly and definitively, and are not afraid to say no. They are open-minded, asking why rather than why not. They're consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of their existence, unafraid to learn or correct their mistakes. They are normal Americans. And that brings me to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. And until next time, thank you very much for listening, and have a great day.